This is what you call road hugging weight. But it accelerates nicely. It pulls, I mean, the car is 6,000, it's three tons. Welcome COVID enthusiasts. Another episode of Jay Lono's Garage. The car we're featuring today, 1934 Duesenberg Walker Coupe. This is the aerodynamic coupe, the only aerodynamic Duesenberg ever developed. Uh, this was built especially for Lilly Pharmaceutical. I'm sure you've heard of them out of Indianapolis, just a huge company. In the 30s, they were, well, probably still are one of the biggest and wealthiest companies in the world. There are two brothers, Eli Lilly II and Josiah Lilly. Josiah Lilly was the brother, the younger brother of Eli, and he was the president of Lilly Pharmaceutical. And he was the car enthusiast. He was a very conservative, very private guy, but he liked his cars. He wanted Duesenberg, which was literally just down the street from them in Indianapolis, to design a car especially for him. So he walked down there and he met with, I think, Harold Ames, the president of Duesenberg, and uh, told him what he wanted. And of course, being Lilly Pharmaceutical, money was no object, making this the most expensive Duesenberg ever produced. This was $5,000 more than the legendary 20 grand Duesenberg, which showed up at the World's Fair. Okay, let's see what we have here. What he wanted was an aerodynamic coupe. He wanted a car that was efficient and sleek and modern in every sort of interpretation of that word. He didn't want something that looked old fashioned. And I think a guy named Phil Durham, if I'm not correct, was the head of design at Duesenberg. And he had a new designer named J. Herbert uh, Newport, who designed this car. Uh, this Newport had worked on what was called the Baby Duesenberg, which later became the Cord 810. Now, this car was built before that went into production, but he had some similar ideas. But the 810 Cord, although it looks sleek and kind of sinister, it was not aerodynamic. This car was truly aerodynamic. For example, now you see these headlights here. I know these look like implants on a bad stripper, but these are here for a specific reason, as opposed, if they were in the fender, they would not be as aerodynamic. See, the, it's right in the center line of the fender. The wind comes in, breaks here, and goes out this way. That was more aerodynamic than having, you know, a, a crank where the, you know, the headlight came out in a bucket or something of that nature. Uh, notice that what they call the biplane bumpers. That looks like two wings of an aircraft. Well, that's what they're supposed to look like. What they do is that cuts the wind much more efficiently, the big flat bumper. Um, this grill here, which was, I think, probably the single most expensive automotive part you could come up with back in the day. This grill was $1,200. Now, a house was $1,200 in, in the early 30s. The V windshield, notice the way it's slanted back. It's very aerodynamic, very aircraft looking, and the interior is really aircraft looking, but we'll get to that in a, in a second. Um, you've got these sort of pontoon fenders. I gotta tell you how I came to get this car. That's another fascinating story. Well, I guess I'm getting off the, the track here. Uh, let me go back to Lily. What happened to Lily was uh, Lily got this car and being a conservative guy and a very private guy, it was just too big and too flamboyant. Remember, this is the middle of the depression and people threw rocks at cars like this back in the day. Because uh, you see this thing, I mean, this looks like it was just meant to run over poor people. That was the idea behind it. You look like a landlord coming to collect the rent, pulling up in this thing. Plus, uh, Josiah Lilly did not drive. I don't think he, well, he drove, but he never drove this car. He always had a chauffeur. And it's, since it's a two-seater car, it's somewhat cramped. It looked rather odd as these two guys driving along with a chauffeur sitting right next to him, as opposed to sitting in the back. Anyway, he felt the car was too hot, a little too big, too unwieldy. He only kept it for a year. And the interesting thing was, when this car came out in 1934, he, he met with uh, Ames, I think, in May, uh, looked at the plans for the aerodynamic coupe, and in August, it was ready to be mounted on the chassis. Uh, the chassis for this car weighs 4,400 pounds. And with the body on it, it makes this thing well over three tons. I, I mean, it's, it's but, you know, the aerodynamics really work. It's 70 miles an hour. This is turning less RPM than the other Duesenbergs. And it does cut the wind. And you can actually have a conversation. It's pretty quiet in this car because the wind literally cuts through it and goes over it. Anyway, 
Josiah Lilly had the car just about a year. He traded it in, it, and then, oh, it went to New York, and then it was bought by a woman named Rita DeMay, something like that. She was the mistress of one of those Tammany Hall politicians, a guy named Boss, oh, sounds like Boss Hogg, Boss Haig, something like that. Anyway, they had one of these relationships that was sort of, uh, ooh, hush, hush, you know, that kind of thing. So the car was never really seen in public. She kept it, she was Canadian, and she would drive this from New York to Canada to visit her family. She took this thing to Europe with her, but it was never really photographed or seen much, okay? Then, a guy named Otto Stoyer, or S-T-O-Y-E, he owned a gas station in Long Island. By this time, the car was starting to get a little worn. He bought this thing, and believe it or not, he used it as a tow truck. It had a a hook in the back and he would drag cars off the highway with it and it was left outside and the fenders rotted and the top. This is a leather top, by the way. This is leather. Every time it rains, you just go back to the dealership and they put a new top on. Well, <laughs> how cost efficient is that? But that's what you're dealing with here. These were, these were rich people back in the day. Anyway, this thing sat in the back of Otto's gas station for 10 years maybe 15 years, just rotting away. And the guy I got it from, Morton French, bought it in 1963 for $400. Now French was a very wealthy guy who owned a patent on a number of plastics, and, but he was, shall we say, thrifty. And uh, he didn't put a lot of time or effort in it. He had a buddy of his, a gentleman named Herb Guthrie, did a lot of work on the car. But it was not done the way we think of doing work on a classic today. You know, he put white leather in it, a few other things. Anyway, my friend Randy Ema, who was the Duesenberg expert, he had uh, never seen this car, but he'd always heard about it. Because don't forget, nobody saw it back in the day. Once it got delivered to Lilly, it just went into their mansion, their compound, and was never really seen. And then it got bought by the, the mistress of that guy, and then it went to Canada. So nobody really knew this car. And every time Randy was in New York and wanted to see this, uh, Morton French, they wouldn't interested in showing it to him. Then finally, Guthrie, who was working on like a call, Randy about some parts or some information, invited Randy to come see it. And Randy realized, oh my God, this thing is really kind of cool looking. Cause when you see period photos of it, and there aren't many, it just looks big and ugly. But in person, it's actually quite sleek and kind of sinister and really fascinating looking. So he told me about it. I said, well, I got to buy this car. So I call up Morton, and he, he was one of these irascible guys, well into his 80s. Uh, I, I must have talked to him every week for a year. So finally, he, was, he wanted half a million dollars for it. It was just a complete wreck, but it's the only one. So I said, okay. So I bought it for half a million dollars. Okay. I go to give him the check. He goes, no, I don't want the check. No, I'm not paying capital gains. Capital gains is 28%. I'm not paying that. I'm not paying the government. 20. The government's not getting my money. Blah, blah, blah. I said, what do you want? Just hold on to it. Just hold on to it. Well, what about that? Just take the car. Just don't pay me. I don't, I don't want to. I'm not paying capital. Okay, so I get the car back here. And now Pebble Beach is about mm, 11 months away to do this car. And let's see, Randy did a Herculean task restoring this car. Uh, went to Randy's shop. They made new fenders, did everything. The, the, the engine from years of towing cars off the road was completely worn out, just beaten and thrashed. This thing was, every single part needed to be fixed or replaced. Okay, well, Randy did all that. Meanwhile, you know, you're writing checks to get this thing done. I still don't own it, okay? Pebble Beach is coming up. I figure, well, I've owned the car, God, about eight, nine months now. Let me call Martin again. Martin, I want to get, no, I'm, I'm not paying capital gains. I'm not going to pay that guy. The government's not getting my, all right, fine, fine. So I figure, well, let me, let me talk to his wife. You know, so I, a couple weeks later, I call the wife and go, hi, listen, you know, I got half a million dollars of your money. I'd like to give it to you. And I hear Martin go, is that Leno? Tell him not get that the capital gain. All right, fine. So like, he doesn't want to take the money because he doesn't want to pay capital gain. It makes no sense to me. Okay, and then the car gets finished. The car's done. I put another half a million bucks into it. It's now in, at Pebble Beach, okay? We got second place because uh, the car wasn't quite finished. It literally ran for the first time that morning at Pebble Beach. Randy was so hectic. It did a beautiful job. We won most elegant car. We got a bunch of other things. It was really fun. It was great. It was great. So now I, I've got the car. 
but I still don't own it, you know? And Morton is like 88 years old at this point. So I'm thinking, what am I going to do? Okay, so I just sit on it for a couple of weeks, and I pick up the paper and say, Clinton to lower capital gains from 28% to 20%. Okay. I say, so I said, when did that happen? Oh, what happened yesterday? So I called Martin. I go, Martin. He goes, I'm, I'm, I said, Martin, did you check the paper? Oh, the capital gains. Yeah, it's down to 20%. He goes, all right, send me the check. I fine. So I sent him the check, and sadly, two weeks later, he had passed away. But if that had happened like two weeks earlier, I wouldn't have owned the car. I would have been a nightmare, but it worked out okay. It's really an unusual car. It's, it's just interesting that there's no history on it because it's just been hidden all this time. Uh, as you can see, you've got these massive doors here that open so you can uh, allow cool air in or hot air out, depending on what, what, what you like. These hubcaps are interesting. These weigh like 14 pounds a piece. So, okay, we had new ones made. And one day I'm going down the... <laughs> the five freeway, I'm driving along going about 70, and one, I hit a bump, a hubcap flies off, it hits the ground, turns into a Frisbee, and because I step on the brake at that point, I see it go in front of me, it goes like this, it's it literally frisbeeing through the air, bang, it hits the retaining wall, goes, ac goes across, luckily it didn't take anybody out, so I go to the next exit, and I go around and I pick it up, and it was all dented and everything, but luckily it didn't hit anybody. If you saw the last Duesenberg video we did, I showed you how this wheel lock worked. When you tighten it, it pulls this forward so it unlocks the wheel so you can get the wheel off. But you can look at that video and see how that works. What we did not discuss were these, uh, well, these trim rings here. The way these work is, these hold the tire on. You see, there's a ridge on the inside that applies pressure against the, uh, against the wheel. So when you fill a tire with air, it pushes out and locks the tire in place. Now what happens with a lot of old cars, and we've done it too, you have something called hydrogen embrittlement, is when you chrome steel, unless you bake it immediately after it's chromed, it'll become brittle, and that's what happened. Okay. Here are two wheel rims off this car. These were done before I got it. They had been chromed by somebody else. And what happened was you go down the road and boom, literally the tire falls off. Uh, what happened was this car, as I said, weighs 6,000 pounds. And at 70 miles an hour going around a corner, I have no idea how much pressure is on that wheel lock, but uh, that rim lock, but it's, it's a lot. As you can see, it just, it just breaks these, just shatters them like nothing, like glass. But that's what's called hydrogen embrittlement. When you get something chrome, it doesn't happen with nickel. only happens with chrome. When you take steel and you chrome it, you need to bake it immediately after you've chromed it, or else it'll, it'll begin to, well, get brittle. It'll get brittle from the chroming process and will lose all its tensile strength. So that's what happened here. Luckily, we didn't have an accident. We didn't get killed, but just something to be careful about. Come on, let's go look at some other car. All right, let's open the hood. Let's see. There's nothing, there's nothing light on this car. Everything is heavy. This hood is massive. If anybody decides to make carbon fiber producing rubber bodies, let me know. Let me show you what this engine looks like. Okay. Now, as I've said in the past, all Duesenbergs were built in 1928. Uh, it just took 10 years to sell them because the Depression hit. And what they did back in the day was that every year you bought the car, that was the year it was titled. So even though this engine was developed and built in 1929, it's considered 1934. And it had some upgraded features. Notice this is a downdraft carburetor. Most of them were updraft carburetors. Um, carburetion had gotten good enough to the point where they would seal and the gas wouldn't leak past the, the valves. This also has an air cleaner, which was not common. Um, has all the usual Duesenberg features, the computer here that controls the lights on the dashboard. We discussed that in the previous video. You, if you want to take a look, I don't want to be redundant to people here. You've got over here, you've got your uh, chassis lubricator. Every 80 miles, it automatically lubricates the chassis. Just all kinds of cool stuff like that. There's your, your Duesenberg dipstick. There's no dipstick, just a needle. And when you want to drain the oil, just flick that switch and it all dumps out the bottom. Uh, cast aluminum firewall, just a beautiful, beautiful 
piece of machinery. It costs 420 cubic inches, four valve per cylinder, uh, 265 horsepower, which doesn't seem like much today, but back in the day, that was twice the power of any other car. I think the Chrysler Straight 8 had, well, I know the Masada Fashini had 180 horsepower. I think Chrysler had 130, Cadillac was 160, 180. This was the most powerful engine you could buy and pretty much a torque monster. And you needed every one of those 265 horses to, to move this car because it weighs three tons, three speed transmission. Uh, actually, once underway, it drives pretty nicely. It's pretty smooth, but it is, it is a big, big car. When I read that that woman who uh, was going out with the Tammany Hall politician, when she took this to Europe, I just can't imagine driving this through the Cotswolds in England, just let me, it's, it's wider than the road, just running over people. Uh, hilarious. But yeah, there you go. That's the engine. Let, let's close this up. Let me show you how hard it is to close this. You, you need to sort of do this. This is really heavy. Well, your door popped open there. Let's see. And another annoying thing is the fact that all Duesenberg, every lock on a Duesenberg is a separate key. Let's see, here we go. Is it locked? We got it? In? No, I'm not locked in. Hang on. See, I don't edit this to show you this is what you have to go through when you, own the, when you watch other videos. People, all oh, things seem to happen magically, you know. Cars always start first time, but there you go. And then it locks in. I just leave the key in there in case of fire. All right, let's move down. I've got, you've got air vents here, here, and here to bring air into the cockpit. Because that was another problem Josiah Lilly had with the car. It was too hot. It was just so hot in this thing. So he sent it back to the factory, uh, or to Walker, the company who built the body, and they insulated it, but not properly. They just insulated the the rugs from the, what it did was it just kept the heat in and made it actually worse. The doors in this thing are massive. This is like a safe. Listen to this shot. <laughs> look at these hinges, how they graduate here. You have four massive hinges. These look like something off a bank vault. Just amazingly huge. You've got a courtesy light down here. It's not on now because I, the battery is switched off because it's parked here. Give me an idea how impractical this car is. I've got to show you the trunk. <laughs> you need two people to put gas in this. Because, again, here's the aerodynamic features of this. Notice the tail lights are knife edged so the air goes under here. And you have these biplane bumpers again so the air goes through here. Uh, there's no exterior handle here because they didn't want anything to, to break the wind. So let me open this up. Again, a different key for everything. There we go. Uh, as you see, you can't even put anything in the trunk because of the spare tire is there. And you got your gas filler right here, so you have to have one guy put his shoulder here like this, you see. If you're by yourself, you kind of do it this way. So you put your face on that, and then you stick the, the hose in there. It's it, hilarious. It makes no sense at all. But that's pretty much what you had to do. And then listen to this shot. <laughs> Bam. And these open up as well. When you want to change a tire, the fender skirts are keyed. You see, and they it lifts it into a socket that you lift that out and you can change a tire. I mean, the skirts really make it. It looks weird without the skirt. Oh, here's something else cool. I forgot about this is your golf door. For those of you that play golf, Hope this is the right key. There we go. And I keep tools, and there's that Duesenberg wrench I always talk about to get the wheel off. Okay, here we are inside the car. Uh, this is just a slip cover. We did the upholstery in the original broadcloth like it had. And in fact, I made these covers out of the same material. And these are just slip covers, but they fit so well and they're pinned in the back that you'd have to pull the whole seat apart to take them off. But that shows you what 
the original interior looked like. And besides, with these uh, coveralls on, they might be greasy. I don't want to get them all dirty, so I'll give you some idea what that looks like. That rear window cranks down. Oh, here you go. That's kind of cool. You got two glove compartments, each with fire extinguishers in them. And remember I told that story about having a fire extinguisher that was the same color as the car? Well, here it is here, yeah. I did the same thing here. And when I had a fire, I couldn't find it. But there it is. There's another fire extinguisher. I always carry those. Very aviation-oriented in the, in the uh, interior of the car. Don't forget, Lindbergh had just a few years earlier flown the ocean. And aviation was moving so quickly and advancing so quickly. And uh, everybody wanted to have an aviation-style dashboard. That's why you have a compass up here in the roof, as you would have in an airplane of the period. You've got an altimeter. You've got the full complement of gauges. You've got the air meter, speedometer, a brake pedal uh, pressure. You've got four-wheel hydraulic brakes with a booster on this thing. Your speedometer, oil pressure, uh, air meter, and of course your uh, water temperature. You have your four gauges here. This is chassis lubrication. Let you know to check it. This lets you know when it's working. A light comes on every 1,400 miles to check the water and the battery. Another light comes on every 700 miles to tell you to check the oil or to change the oil. That's what they do. You change the oil every 700 miles. Um, got your mirror here, a little cigarette lighter. Very cool. Try and find one of those. That's a rare piece. Uh, and a dopey little ashtray up here. Like, whew, very cool. He's flicking that. Uh, these are kind of neat. You've got these are plastic tinted. So you look through them, which I th is rather clever. You got air vents down below. You got exhaust cut out down there. But as you can see, it's still pretty cramped in here. Uh, I've got the, um, uh, the battery disconnect switch on, so none of the interior lights are on. But they obviously come on when you open the door. Uh, you can get more air in here. These cars were very hot. In the winter, it was fabulous. In the summer, it was uh, not real good. That's why uh, Lily got rid of his. Uh, but we'll take it next door. We'll put it up on the lift, and we'll show you what this thing looks like so it Looks like underneath. OK, we've got it up on our Stelconi lift. Show you what it's like underneath here. Remember, this is a 25-year-old restoration, but it still looks good. It still looks, you know, we clean under here all the time. Doesn't appear to be any leaks. There's your battery box. That's different from the standard Duesenberg. Under there, it's just a pain. As you can see, we like the Optima batteries because there's no gas. They don't leak. You don't get uh, corrosive fluids going into everything. There's, there's the, the original muffler still on it. God bless them. Uh, there's your torque tube. OK, there you go. And of course, massive crankcase, 12 huge quarts of oil. I guess huge quarts of oil sounds silly. It's 12 quarts of oil. Uh, and there's your drain plug like the other Duesenbergs. You throw that switch that I mentioned under the dash, under the, excuse me, on the block, and all the uh, oil just comes out of there. And that holds. You wouldn't think it would, but it does. You know, it's almost better than the drain plug because you can't strip it. Okay, there's your radiator behind the grill. You see your hydraulic brakes. And of course, that massive 4,400 pound chassis. Look at that beautiful uh, crankcase there, very nice. There's your transmission. There's your vacuum booster right there. There's your better shot of your battery right there, a little six volt. Look how big that battery tray is. That shows you how big the original battery was. God, this thing is heavy. You hear it creaking go, <laughs> going up on the lift here. Let's see, look at these frame rails. Just massively strong. There's your render ratio. We put uh, what 355s in this, I think. So it cruises nicely on the freeway at 70 or 80 miles an hour. There's your shocks up there. Electric fuel pump. Normally these had a fuel pump submerged in the tank, but those are a little dangerous. Don't do them anymore. And of course your pipes, and uh, that's pretty much it. Let's, uh, let's take this thing for a ride and see how those aerodynamics work. You know, it goes pretty good. It's got quite a bit of pickup. I couldn't imagine driving this in 1934. 
I guess it would be like a Bugatti Veyron at the time. But you do feel like you're in a little Ford tri-motor, you know, one of those planes with the split windshield, you got the compass up here, and it's a lot of fun to drive. You know, that was the great thing about Duesenbergs, they're really driver's cars. You know, the one I've got, the, the Baron, the, uh, the blue one, we did a couple of months ago, I guess it is now. That's the lowest mileage one I've ever seen with only 46,000 miles. Uh, these, people just drove these things. There was a book by a guy named Albert, I think his name was, uh, called America's Mightiest Motor Car, the Duesenberg. And it was written, I think, in 1951. So uh, all the people that bought the Duesenbergs in the 20s, late 20s and 30s were still alive to talk to him about what the experience is like. It's a great read. If you ever see it around anywhere, you should get a copy. It's fun. People talk about passing people at 100 miles an hour. In fact, one day I was on the 210 freeway here, and it was late at night and I was in one of the Duesenbergs. And I could see up, up ahead, faintly, a, a single little tail light. They kind of, as I get closer, I realize it's a Model A. So I pull up behind the guy and I'm beeping the horn and he's kind of getting annoyed. I pull by and go past him and he had a big smile on his face, you know. I mean, it's probably the first time a Duesenberg has passed a Model A in a long time. You know, Packards, Pierce Arrows, they were all quiet cars. This thing had that throaty rumble. But it accelerates nicely, it pulls, I mean, this car is 6,000, it's three tons. Whenever I drive one of these home, I always take the extra long way, you know. Go out that way, take one freeway, cut over to another freeway. Because they're just so nice to drive. I mean, for as heavy as it is, clutch action, steering action, very nice. I mean, if you're obviously a dead stop, it's a little laborious to turn, but... I mean, look at this, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not showing a lot of strength here. I'm just gently turning the wheel and very nice. Just don't want to put two tires that are too heavy or too big on it. I love second gear. Second gear is good for about 90 miles an hour. In fact, with these 355s, I think second gear is good for about 113, according to the book. You know, there's nothing like a straight eight. I mean, V8s are good, I like V8s. But the straight eight, I don't know, just everything's going in the same direction, you know? There haven't been that many owners of this car, only four, really. And you had, uh, of course, Josiah Lilly. You had uh, the girlfriend of the uh, Tammany Hall boss. You had Otto, the gas station, and Morton French. That was it. You know, they always say, oh, you should buy the best example of a car you can find. But when there's only one example, you got to buy that one. And God, this thing was worn out, blown out. When I got it, it, as I said, it had been used as a tow truck. And all the fenders bashed in, the leather roof peeled off, the interior all chewed up. So it was nice to put it back to its original glory. This is what you call road-hugging weight. <laughs> it really is the most inefficient use of space I've ever seen. The trunk is enormous, but the spare tire is on that slider bar, so that takes up the whole trunk. There's only barely room for two people in this thing. I can't imagine having a chauffeur sitting right next to you. It seems a little goofy. You know, it's funny, Josiah Lilly knew exactly what he wanted. He wanted an aerodynamic car. And that's what he got. He got a really aerodynamic car, but at the time when it was finished, it was so flamboyant. And as I said, he was so conservative. It was, it was still pretty much in the depths of the depression. The drive around Indianapolis is something like this, where people are selling apples for a penny a piece. Oh my God, you know. As I said before, when the, when the factory produced a one-off like this, the first thing they do is they would take it to dealerships and put it on display at auto shows. But nobody ever saw this. This was built pretty much in, in secret. And I think Lily Pills picked it up September 25th, 1934. And the car was never seen again, at least publicly anywhere. I mean, there was no reaction to the car. Nobody knew anything about it. You know, the aerodynamics really do work. You know, other Duesenbergs, you feel that massive front end 
pushing its way through. This is like it's like a blade of a knife. It just cuts through. You can't really even put your elbow out the window because it's too high. And these suicide doors, you don't want to make the mistake of accidentally opening that door. Oh my God. You'd never be able to hold it if it's open. And we're doing 55, 60, and I'm barely 2200 RPM, something like that. The red line in this thing is about 4,000. Yeah, 4,500 you can go maybe, which is unbelievable. Big lump of cast iron like that, eight pistons, 420 cubic inches, moving up and down. I love finding a fast two-lane highway for these. This is where this thing really feels like it's in its element. Because obviously there weren't no super highways when it was built. So to go 60 or 70 on a two-lane road back in the day, only the rum runners were doing that. This is the coziest car on a winter's day. I love taking it out when it's freezing, you know. Nice crisp winter day. Get the engine heat coming through. You know, it's starting to be uh, rush hour here in Los Angeles. Getting near 4 o'clock, 4.30, all the crazies come out. People rushing to get home, so. I'll probably uh, drive a little more and then take it back in. Anyway, I hope you uh, enjoyed this uh, little trip in the Duesenberg. If you've never seen one, they're just fascinating cars. And I wish more owners would get out and use them and drive them so the parts would be made available, you know? The Bentley Drivers Club is the best. All the Bentley owners drive the car. A lot of Duesenberg guys just park them or put them in a museum, and that's not where they belong. They belong on the open road, so. If you see me out driving this thing, uh, just say hello. See you guys later. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.